You're watching West Hartford Community Television. You're watching West Hartford Community Television. For the community, by the community. And thank you for joining me for yet another episode of Two Guys and a Lot of Wine. And fresh back from Riviera Maya, Mexico, I am tan, I am pink, and I am ready for rosé tonight. And I have two repeat guests. Actually, Chris has been on the show three times. Steve has been on twice. And uh, I'll do a quick introduction for some of you who've already met these guys before. We have Steve Adler, the man who gave me the idea to start this show originally, all those almost four years back. Yeah. And uh, Chris Williams, a fine barrister of justice here in the West Hartford area. And uh, Chris, I've enjoyed every time you've been on the show. And Steve, Thanks, you too. I've enjoyed it. And I'm not tan. That's, well, you're not, but uh, <laughs> that's okay. The summer's early. It's May when you guys are watching this show. And uh, hopefully you have some rosés in front of you like we have tonight and enjoying them, as hopefully we will be too. So I figured now is the time to do a rosé show. I've talked about it for a long time. I've never done an all-rosé show. And I have three great gems here. For us to drink tonight and i know steve you're you're a bubbles guy most of the time you like your gin hopefully some of these rosés will this, this is not a gin show it is not a gin show but oh, i i was thought this was a gin show i know you did and oh. I, I i lied to you to get you I, into the I, studio I, I'll, I'll, but I'll, i'll i'm going to keep you here anyways okay. just to liquor you up so thank, thank you thank you very much <laughs> but uh anyways i have three gems here tonight and i hope we're going to enjoy them and uh i, I don't know if any of you guys have any experience with rosés at all in the in your drinking times and so forth. But rosés are, are kind of interesting. I mean, they've really only become popular. They started to become popular as a fad probably back in the 60s, early 70s. And there were two um, Portuguese wine distributors that sort of brought two varietals in. And the bottles were very sexy. And uh, they were delicious wine. They really took off. And Americans fell in love with them. But of course, as soon as somebody falls in love with something in a good old America, capitalism takes over and the American wine industry decided to try to copy that. And unfortunately, a lot of the stuff that came out as rosés became the dreaded white Zinfandel, which a lot of people in the wine business loathe. So there's always been kind of a tenuous relationship with rosés because there's still that stigma back from the time where rosés in America really weren't that good. And they're sort of labeled very sweet and cloying. But we have three original European-made rosés tonight. And they're still probably the best you can get uh, European rosés. So there are some right now good rosés in America. And uh, the first one we're going to try actually is a French rosé tonight. It's, I believe it's a, a terracotte rosé. It's um, from southwest France. It's a Côte de Gaston region. And uh, it's one of my favorites. I've had it a few times. And um, I didn't get a chance to drink it in Mexico because the last thing you want to drink in Mexico is wine. Generally, you're drinking gin or those margaritas, mm. as you would yes. also be joining yeah. with me if you were there too, Steve. Well, well I didn't get the call, so yeah. well, well, I wasn't invited. Yes. You weren't, we but were. uh, maybe next time. <laughs> so let's give this one a little, uh, this is a beautiful pomegranate red color. On camera, you might be able to tell that the difference in colors between all three of these will progress into the evening. Mm. This is the darkest one tonight. And uh, the reason you get this color is very similar to how you get any color in a, in a wine, is the fermentation process and how long the grape skins actually stay in contact while they're fermenting. So the little bit longer time that the grapes are fermenting before they're removed, the darker the color. So this right off the bat should be a little bit heavy on the bouquet. And where are these grapes uh, from a region uh, perspective? That would be this, the grapes that are grown for this particular wine would be the southwest region of France. Okay. Um, French wines are regional, just I believe like Italian wines. They're, the regions that they're grown in determine what type of grape, the variety of a grape, how it's going to taste, and so forth like that. This happens to be a 2012, but uh, it should have a really, really nice bouquet and a really subtle but yet intense mm. flavor. Mm. 
That's delicious. That's and this is probably good. the best temperature. This has been recently chilled. It's only been sitting out for a short time. And I think at this temperature, you really get a lot of character in this wine right off the bat. And Bob, to play off something you said a little earlier, um, I enjoy rosés in the warmer weather. And I think that a sort of a darker rosé goes really well with some barbecue. Yeah, and I'll, I'll point out right now, of all these rosés that we'll be tasting tonight can go with pretty much any type of food in the summer. Mm -hmm. A nice chilled rosé would go with any of those foods. Um, there's nothing that a good rosé won't go with at all, actually. And actually, a little bit more history about the rosé is it's about 2,000 years old. I mean, the ancient Greeks sort of had a rosé. They used to add water to their, their um, wine, more of a mythological reason um, than any other reason. Mm -hmm. But that's sort of because they liked it the pinkish hue. And that's sort of what's originally started people trying to produce wines with that pinkish hue, more for mythological reasons than anything else. Mm. But uh, the, the history of rosé is pretty old. But I, I love this, this particular rosé. This is really great. So, so I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. You know, on rosé, and, and this is a great topic, only because you're, you're the expert here, are all rosés the same? No. No. So There are blends of rosés. Actually, the uh, second we'll be drinking, the Spanish one, is a 100%. Mincia grape. Um, these two, I believe, do have some blends mm -hmm. of different grape varietals. Um, once again, when you're buying rosés, you can ask your, your wine guy or whoever you're asking to give you some more history. You can do some research online yourself. Okay. Um, but all the grapes, a lot of different grapes can produce a rosé. Um, but the two French ones that we'll be drinking tonight are a blend. Uh, I've actually, I actually have what's written as the blend down in one of these papers here because I didn't want to mislead anybody that we're drinking some blends for tonight. But the Spanish one is a 100% Mencia grape. So that's the one we're going to be hitting next. But uh, So, uh, so the, 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 the Tarakit. Yes. And, and, and so from a, a being that I'm a, a little on the cheap side, uh, <laughs> which uh, people, some people may admit to. So price point. Yeah, I usually wait till the NC, but because Go ahead, I'm sorry. you are a fiscal conservative, and I love you for that. <laughs> I knew politics would come into the show sooner or later. I'm just saying. That we are is in budget season, so. uh, between ten and twelve dollars. Okay, which for a true rosé at this flavor profile, I think is phenomenal. I think it's a delicious wine, um, and I love it. I love this one. I'm trying not trying to bias you guys, but I'm giving it a thumbs up right off the bat. Now I've had it before, so I'm biased, but so be it. Great. I'll join you. Thumbs up. Thumbs up. Two thumbs up. All right. Yeah. <clears throat> hey Bob, can I just ask you a quick question? Sure. You just made reference to the fact that some of these are blends? Yes. Now, do you mean blends of different types of rosés, or do you mean blends... Oh, different types of grapes. Okay, because I know there's a, there's a conception out there that rosés are sometimes white wine mixed with red wine. Yes, no, that's okay. not at all. It's, it, uh, um, it's really for a question of it's the red grape, or it's the type of grape that isn't fermented quite as long. Because any wine is going to be the color of how long you let the grape ferment. Obviously, a white wine is a little bit different because you're using a different style of grapes. But a rosé is the same type of grape that you would use to make any wine, whether it's a Merlot or Cabernet Sauvignon, dark. But you just don't keep the skin in contact for as long as in, in the fermentation process. So, like I said, that's why this one's a little darker. This one, the skins have been in contact in the fermentation process a little bit longer, which probably gives you that really bold aroma right off the bat. And I, I'm impressed that you like that, Steve. I know in the past uh, we've had differences on your yeah, liking. Yeah, you know, I, I uh, you know, as long as I've known you, I, I typically follow your lead uh, only because, um, you know, my uh, understanding the uh, the territory around rosés and other wines. So I, I liked it. It kind of had a soft finish, though. It didn't have a, a sweet finish. No, it definitely didn't have a sweet finish, which yeah, is good. Yeah, which, it, which is good. Well, that's yeah. still part of the stigma. You know, a, a lot of the quote-unquote wine snobs, wine connoisseurs still, um, and though a lot of rosés are highly rated, Robert Parker and so forth, Wine Spectator, but there's still some people, they see a rosé and they say, oh, that's a white Zinfandel, I can't drink that. That's going to be too sweet. It's going to be disgusting. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I mean, when it comes to European rosés, mm -hmm. um, even the inexpensive ones can be unlike any type of cheap Zinfandel, white Zinfandel that you would get when, you know, you were dating back in college, and your, <laughs> your date would want a white Zinfandel over dinner. And uh, you know, even back in the day, I, I cringed uh, when the lady would ask for a white Zinfandel. So that was the first know. and last yeah. date. Yeah. Well, you know, it's uh, I actually wasn't into wine as much back then. You it was know, my beer. And my dates uh, <laughs> uh, typically ask for scotch. So uh, you know, they were pretty exciting dates. Doesn't surprise me, Steve. I'm just 
ad-libbing as we go. So. But I will add that uh, the French rosé tonight, like especially the Terracat, um, it's a very family-owned vineyard. Uh, they actually analyze each hectare region of soil to determine which type of grape they're going to plant and how that's going to come out. So, I mean, the French are, are masters when it comes to wine, mm -hmm. especially the rosés. So, um, uh, interesting. bravo. Bravo for the first one. Yeah. So yeah. the second one's going to be a little bit interesting because, uh, as you know, Chris, and I think uh, Steve's had a few experience with Spanish wine, I love my Spanish wines. And I've only had a few Spanish rosés. Now, this one's lighter in color, so I'm not sure if you're going to get the same type of uh, bouquet right off the bat with this one. Much milder, much milder right off the bat. The color, as you can see, is also a little bit lighter. You should be able to see that on camera. Mm -hmm. Not bad. I see this one is a little sweeter. It is. Would you agree with that? I, I do. Mm. Absolutely. It's got a floral smell to it as well. It does. And I know we've talked about this in the show in the past, but this has more of a lingering aftertaste. Um, it's still sort of coating my throat and tongue. That's and true. I, it's, a, it, it's certainly a much more, uh, I think you, you have, um, alluded to it, much more sweeter, um, broader taste. Mm, very much yeah, so. And absolutely. I, I want to say, especially a sweeter rosé like this, like I like Thai food, very spicy Thai food, this might be something that really cut the spice. Um, a little bit more than the terracat at first, though the terracat would certainly cut the spice, but a little bit, this little bit sweeter risotto um, I think would be a little bit better when you had some hot Thai food. So the, these uh, particular grapes, and I'm always interested in the, the region, uh, the origination, so, so these grapes are a blended grape? Uh, no, this, uh, the Spanish wine is a 100% Mencia grape. Okay. They're in the uh, northern half of the country. And uh, the temperature variety, the temperature climate is conducive to that particular grape. Okay. And uh, it's actually one of the most popular grapes. You can get that particular grape in a darker color bottle or dark, darker wine that would look just like any other red wine. It's very interesting. Like I said, I, I don't know if it's my favorite. I think this is only the second time I've actually had this particular one. The temperature is right. It's cool. Um, hopefully when we get to the creme de la creme, end here, um, which is really the pride and joy here this evening. But I still like this. I think there's a, there's a lot of purpose here. I think it's good, too. Um, so, Bob, you said, you know, it should obviously have a little chill to it. If you were going to serve this with a meal, how long before the meal would you recommend refrigerating it? Good question. Now, I know uh, in the past, um, as you know, when both you or Steve have been over my house, I usually always have wine chilled along with the standard fare, as you know. Yes, um, yes. I, which is plentiful. Which is plentiful. <laughs> I like keeping stuff usually in a regular chiller for most of the evening. Rosés, though, like this, can probably sit out unchilled for about a half hour before you might have to put it back in a, a chiller or something like that. Because these have been sitting out about almost 25 minutes now. Mm. And there's still a, a coolness to the, the flavor. I don't think you're losing anything. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, do you... So, so uh, it's a question to ask you, and, and, you know, in terms of what you can have with uh, this particular uh, uh, blend, what can you have with it? How, uh, and, and I think the rules are kind of broken because you can probably have, you know, red or with meat or now with fish. So, so what are those rules? Well, maybe Steve, there are no rules. As you know, for Bobby P, I have no rules when it comes to wine specifically. And I know Jim, uh, you know, still up in Boston doing great with his job. Uh, thumbs up to you out there, Jim. But uh, when it comes to wine, you drink what you generally like. Okay. Now, rosés. The reason I've wanted to do a rosé show is because people still tend to shy away from rosés. But once you try a good rosé, especially this time of year, I mean, come on, guys, it's going to be May. You're sitting on your back deck. You're sitting outside somewhere. You got to go for rosé. It's it's more refreshing to me than sometimes a Chardonnay or a Sauvignon Blanc, even a Pinot Grigio. It looks pretty, you know. It's it's beautiful in the glass, and if you get the right one, it's really going to complement. I mean, what do you like to eat? I know you, you eat a lot of places here in town. What do you eat? Yeah, I mean, specifically, I mean, you know, we hit uh, the Adlers, Darlene and I. We hit all the places. I mean, I you know the Max places, uh, you know the um, you know the downscale, the upscale. Um, you know, I I think. I think what's great about uh, different wines, my wife uh, likes Prosecco, and she's a big fan of that, and I was going to ask you about a Prosecco show at some point. But, but I think, you know, the fact that there's no rules and that you can have fish, you can have, you know, a nice, uh, you know, scrot or, or, or fish with different varieties of wine, 
makes it kind of interesting because I think people are so structured. The fact that you're saying there is no rules, you can have basically whatever you want. Uh, well, Chris, I'm sure you feel the same way when it comes to certain wine, though. Yeah. There are some wines that taste better with certain kinds of food. I think that's right. And the thing that I like about the rosé is that you can serve it chilled in the summer with, you know, like burgers or chicken, and it complements those meals well. Whereas if you were going to have a Chardonnay with a hamburger, it might not match up. That's right. So I think that this is a nice balance for the warmer uh, season, if, you know, if that's the cuisine you're looking for. Yeah, well, I'm going to give you one of my, I've done this before on the show, and this is a little technique that I use a lot when I'm uh, either having parties, or even when I'm out in a restaurant, and I go to a lot of BYOB places, as you guys know. Guys know. <clears throat> the little pour that I just did, whether it's for any type of white, rosés, you do a little pour like that, a little bigger, obviously. I'm doing it for a little, a little bit shorter on, here on TV, but that's a cool sip. So you take a cool sip. Maybe have one more little sip. Then you can pour another glass while it's still in the cooler. A lot of people, and I'm sure you've all seen it, you're at a wedding, you're at anywhere, and people, even when they serve you a glass of wine in a restaurant, a white wine, it's usually right up to the top. Mm. Now, unless you're in the mood to chug that white wine, it's going to be pretty warm by the time it gets down here. And you're going to lose a lot of the character in the wine. So I prefer, as, as you guys know, I love my BYOB places, and there's quite a few of them here in the area, which I would strongly recommend you trying. Um, you can pour your own. And you pour a couple sips or pour a smaller pour, it's cool. You go back to the bottle, pour another one. Keep it cool, keep it refreshing, and keep the true characteristics of the flavor in the wine. You know, that, that's what I really love about, um, I'm a little biased here, but that's what I really enjoy about this show in that there's no parameters, you know, there's no guidelines. It's, it's you know, what you enjoy eating, this is what you enjoy drinking. You know, with rosé, I think, you know, with fish, or I I'm, I'm happen to be a, a big steak eater. Um, so, you know, I think it's, it's uh, certainly uh, helpful to understand that. And I know you love history, and the Spanish have been growing, in, been in viniculture for 2,000 years or more. So just like the Italians, just like the French, Greeks, they've been making wine a long time. And um, I would strongly recommend anybody who's just getting into wine, going to a store, I would even say try Spanish wine first, because I've never had a Spanish wine that I haven't really liked. Even the really cheap stuff is still pretty good. Well, I see people's glasses empty. So, <laughs> so now we're going into sort of the higher end. I mean, generally I don't go into wines over $20, but I figured thank what you. the heck. Thank you. Brother. What the heck tonight? It's a Coast de Providence Romery Rosé. Beautiful pink salmon color right off the bat. I mean, I just think it's gorgeous. Even holding the bottle, I'm getting kind of excited. So, you know, it's, it's beautiful. Not, it's absolutely too. beautiful. No, I'm, I'm fine where I am. Thank you. <laughs> and some of thank my you, favorite rosés are this color. Um, it's, it's, it's such a subtle pink salmon color that it just is gorgeous. It's absolutely gorgeous. I'm, boy, I'm really coming across as a wine nut right now, aren't I? No. But it's just man. beautiful. It's beautiful. Just passionate. Cheers. Shalanta. <laughs> a very mild bouquet in this one. Very mild. Wow. Yeah, that's very nice. Very mild, huh? But you see, this is what's fascinating about this one. The color profile looks like it's not going to be anything special. But as soon as you take that first sip, it just opens right up, in my opinion. Yeah, your palate. It, it's funny, Bob, because you know me, I like Malbecs, Shirazes, you know, it's the red wines. So I thought right off the bat I would like the Terraket. But I think this is my favorite. I mean, it's just the flavor is very, very smooth. It's a 40 hectare estate. Um, it's been in the same valley for, for generations. Um, they're meticulously won numerous awards for their wines, not just their rosés, mm. but I think I get a little bit of honey in there, sort of also. It's just fascinating how good this it's, is. It has really a wonderful finish to it. And they use a combination of modern and traditional aging techniques. So even though it's a, it's a generational uh, vineyard, they've incorporated some modern techniques along with traditional aging processes, which just manufacture an absolutely fantastic rosé. Oh, this is great. I could, I could match this with shellfish. When I had this, I could see you know, some clams yeah. or something along those lines. And to answer your question, Steve, it is a, it is a blend of Sinsalt, yeah. Grenache, and Syrah. So it's a three well, varietal. Uh, let me, wow. uh, I, I just want, I'm not sure on the taste. I just want to make sure Chris has a, a full appreciation <laughs> for it. So, so That's why I love having Steve You're, always, you're always looking out for He just for picks me. up the bottle well, and starts pouring. He's just That's looking a, out for us. Do you, got, do you cameramen need anything? Yeah. <laughs> 
Sorry, I know I'm screwing you up. Oh, that, no, not at all. That's okay. No, it's a clay limestone, so, uh, clay limestone when's the, soil. Uh, when's the Manif Manischewitz uh, show uh, going to be happening for, pa for, pa uh, for Yum Kipper? And, uh... Steve, before I answer that question, I must, uh, I oh, must say I'm something. Yeah. You have now officially poured the largest pour ever on two guys and a large well, How many episodes? 27 episodes. Congrats. Thank you. Leave it thank to Steve much. Adler to pour the <laughs> largest pour ever on the show. And you, you can get, if you dial in right now, we have operators standing by for what, all 27 on DVD? Yeah, actually, we, we can. 27 shows, 27. averaging three to four bottles per show. You know, really? Who wants to do the myth, breath, a myth, bleh, arithmetic on that? What's how many bottles of wine is that? You're, I, you know, it's a lot math has never been my Yeah, well, it's a lot. Well, lawyer, it's a lot. Right? Yeah. It, it's a lot of wine, so. <laughs> okay. <laughs> But this is this is great. I was saying yeah. to you before the show. I remember when I was in the south of France, in the Montpellier region, I saw a lot of people drinking reds out at dinner. Uh, excuse me, rosés out at dinner. As, you know, you come back to America, you just <clears> use <throat> the red white. So, go back to your point earlier. It really is more accepted in Europe, probably because they have the appreciation for it. So. How long were you in France? A semester in college. Really? Yes. So you got wow. to yeah, you got to do a little traveling around. Yeah, my. Right? You know, my travels uh, with wine, I was in uh, Putnam, Connecticut um, uh, at Sharp Hill, uh, uh, you know, wine country. It's, I can't compete with France. So. It's not a competition, Steve. I don't know. I'm just, yeah. I'm just tossing it out there. So. Well, well, the funny thing is, like I said, I mean, it's I, kind of funny. It is. Uh, when I, I it toyed is. with doing a rosé show for a long time. Yeah, see, these two guys are on their own over here. They're not even paying any attention to me anymore. But I've toyed with doing a rosé show, strictly rosés. Ever since the uh, uh, West Hartford Gala for West Hartford Television back almost a year and a half, two years ago, back in October, when I actually featured a, uh, a rosé as part of the uh, tasting. I think you were there, Chris. I think you won. Uh, I was indeed. I won, you I won your basket. You did? Yes. And, um, you know, the rosés, out of all the wine we, we donated to the, uh, the function, the rosés was still the least drunk wine. And it, it just rubbed me the wrong way because I think people were just still afraid to try them. Because right. they, they see the bottle. They see automatically, at least some people would say, oh, that's just a, a white Zinfandel. It's going to be terrible. I'm not even going to try it. How do you not try something? You've got to try something. It's, it is. It's a stereotype. It's funny. You, people are afraid to walk around with the pink wine. That's really Especially what it comes a guy. down you know, to. I'll be honest yes. with you. Look at me. I'm a big guy. I, I like me pink's wine. Yeah. So I am not... My manliness is still pretty strong. It's intact. Yeah. Now, my pink shirt, okay, fine. But that's just in conjunction with the color profile we have going on tonight. But... Uh, don't be afraid to try pink uh, rosés. <laughs> we're a little pink. I'm just yeah. standing here. So. But anyways, oh. I, I would like to emphasize again, don't be afraid to try rosés. They're out there right now. Uh, any of the stores here in the local area, uh, whether it be Max's, Westside, uh, Wise Old Dog, which is uh, our go-to place lately, um, they have great stuff. And uh, you should definitely go in and try some because they do tastings. And uh, that's how you get to like stuff. Especially if you like red wine and are looking for something cooler in the summer. I think that this is a great idea. And actually, another little interesting fact about rosé. Some of the best champagne mm. is rosé champagne because it is so difficult to manufacture properly. Mm. Now, obviously, to call it champagne, it has to be from the champagne region. But the most premier champagnes tend to be rosé champagne. It's a very subtle rosé. So if you actually saw a bottle, it would probably be a little bit lighter than what we see here. Mm -hmm. But um, it's considered some of the best champagne to buy is the rosé champagne. So that's good for you to know because I know you yeah. like your bubbles. You know, you know I, I think what's great about the discussion, and, and Chris is certainly uh, uh, much more, you know, uh, in, intelligent about wines, and obviously you are too. You know, it's just, it's not an intellectual you know, uh, a thought process. I mean, it's really around what you enjoy, the, the level of, you know, complexity with the grapes, you know, price points. I mean, it's, it's really up to the consumer uh, as to what they enjoy. That's true. You know, it really is. To a certain level, you are correct. I mean, yeah. a lot of times um, you're steered towards certain wines, whether you, like, if you keep using the wedding situation, but you go to weddings, you see certain manufacturers or brands. But I, but I think people sometimes are, are somewhat intimidated. I mean, you're, you're, ext you're, you're extremely knowledgeable about this, but I think people in general are sometimes somewhat intel you know, intimidated as to what's appropriate and what isn't. And you're kind of breaking it down saying the, the rules don't apply. Well, so. I, I will say, Steve, I, I will disagree with you on one factor. I am not overly schooled in wine. I'm certainly not a, a wine guru. 
I got into wine about 15 years ago because I drank a lot of beer and it was just too filling. <laughs> and I was dating somebody at the time who liked wine. So that's how I got into wine. Mm -hmm. And I just found it more enjoyable, the history of it, mm -hmm. the different varietals. And, you know, you're not drinking, you know, a six pack when you're going out to a restaurant, or you're going out somewhere and feeling like you, you put on 50 pounds. And that's the reason I got into wine. So even before, as you know, Steve, before I did this show, I wanted to keep it at a very low level without coming across this. Because there's plenty of wine shows out there where you can get the intricate details of. But this is the best wine show. Well, that's right. This is the Correct. most laid back yeah, wine. That's that is. exactly right. Right. You're not going to find any guys in bow ties on this so show. So if you're watching right now, this is it. This, this is, is it. the wine this is, show. This is, that's right. This okay. is it. I know you had some thing you wanted to say, Chris, about a rosé cocktail. You had some uh, thoughts yeah, on that? Yeah, if, if you're looking for something kind of fun uh, for the summertime, you like wine, but you also like cocktails, and you, know, you just want to try something new, I, I found a, a, a cocktail recipe I thought was pretty interesting. It's a basil lemonade rose wine cocktail. Rosé, excuse me, not rose. Um, the ingredients are pretty simple. It's two large basil leaves, roughly torn. I don't know what that means. Um, <laughs> one lemon wedge, five ounces of rosé, one ounce citrus vodka, simple syrup uh, to taste, and then ice. And I think with all cocktails, they probably should be shaken, not stirred, but that's of great. course that's optional as well. So I, that, that to me jumped out, and it's just another idea if you want to you know, incorporate rosé into to your evening. It's Don't use $30 idea. rosé, though. Try to stick to the 5 to $10 rosé yeah. if possible. And I don't think that's the way you would really dis, you know, determine whether or not you like rosés. But if you do happen to like rosés after trying different wines, it's a nice way to maybe introduce it to your friends who might be a little bit cautious. Well, uh, even before we wrap up, I want to emphasize, and this is going to shock some of my viewers, I would not be adverse, and I have done this a few times, maybe not this particular rosé, but maybe these other two, maybe one ice cube, one ice cube only. By one ice cube, you a big, like you would if you were making a uh, cocktail for yourself, Steve. Sure, sure. Um, as long as you drink it relatively quick and you don't let the ice melt too much into the wine, mm -hmm. especially if you're sitting outside on your deck. So, um, But just keep it in mind, that cocktail sounds like a great idea. I know uh, people love making cocktails in the summertime. Um, I've only made a few. I think when you were on the show, when Jordan was on the show, Jordan I, Stein, I was, yes. who uh, actually now is running a Bobby Valentine restaurant up near the airport. Congratulations, Jordan. He's no longer with the Pot House. Um, but he was big on the champagne cocktails, which I still haven't had a good champagne cocktail. Mm. Though there was the French 77 or 47, which I, th I could be getting the numbers wrong, but look it up. Um, it's, a fr it's a champagne and a shot of gin and a twist of lemon. Wow. Really? And it's a French something. The name escapes me, but uh, <laughs> anything with a little bit of gin and champagne in it has to be good. Yeah, yeah, it has to so. be, yeah sure. Let, let's, I, I want to examine this one a little bit more. So well, that's, uh, I, I think, is that your favorite for tonight? Actually, you know, quickly I, before I our show is done, is. what is our favorite tonight? Well, Chateau uh, de Farage, uh, Lagarde de Robla, or the uh, Terracat? I'm going to go with the, sh uh, the Chateau as my favorite, which surprises me because it's on the lighter side. Steve, quickly. I think I'm with Chris. I think the Chateau was, you know, it was a little bit smooth. It was a little bit lighter in bouquet. There wasn't a really sharp ending to it. You know, I, I kind of dug that. So the Chateau does it. So yeah, the Chateau the yeah. runs the show, rules yeah. the show. Yeah. And I want to thank all of you for watching this great Rosé show. Enjoy your summer. There will be more, more episodes coming. And until next time, keep all three of us in your wine cellar. Yes. All right. Absolutely. Yeah.